So good morning, everyone. It is Saturday, March 26th, 2022. My name is Barbara With, and you are here with us on the fourth Saturday of the month, which according to our Saturday morning coffee clutch, 9 a.m. gathering, is a deep dive into channeling Einstein and the party. And um, before we get started with that, I just want to... Uh, I just want to talk about a couple things. One is that uh, I've been at Psychic Channel for 35 years, and I've been doing groups since 1993. And it's a long story that you can see on partyof12.com and uh, explore all that historical stuff because it's kind of thick and amazing. But right now, I, I, I'm coming to this place in my own channeling when, when, when I started doing groups in 1993 and they became angels, then it shifted in 98, I realized I was channeling dead people. And then the party of 12 emerged and I, Albert Einstein's voice was the one that I had heard from the beginning of my channeling ever. And it was sort of in the beginning, you remember Lily in the beginning, it had kind of a weird little accent to it that we could never really duplicate. We'd make fun of it and like, oh, I do, 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 do. but we could never really do it until one day. And I think it was right around the time we started doing groups. I heard a National Geographic special with a uh, marine biologist who was Yiddish. And I, I was like, that's it. And then when I channeled Einstein for the first time, I realized, oh my gosh, this voice has been with me my whole life. So I've been watching Genius again. If you haven't seen it, it's about Albert Einstein. It, it's based on the book, uh, Einstein, His Life and Times by Walter Isaacson, which came out at exactly the same time, Imagining Einstein, Essays on M3, World Peace and the Science of Compassion came out in 2006 or seven, whatever the year that was. And it's overwhelming me right now because I'm seeing so many things that are so parallel. Um, one of them is, you know, when he did those, those five uh, theories, his miracle year, 2000 or 1905, he, he was working as a clerk. He, he had been blackballed by a prominent professor at one of the universities he was trying to get into for some personal vendetta. So he was having trouble, not just getting a job, but he was writing these papers, of course, with uh, Milova at his side, doing a lot of the heavy lifting for him. Shall I always remember her too? <laughs> and he was having a hard time getting people to take him seriously because he didn't have credentials. But when he came up with E equals MC squared, and I love how they, they show you the, the progression of his thought experiments. You know, he, he imagined he was riding a wave of light, right? And, and so when he came to me as a dead person, he said, well, guess what? When you lose your body, you don't have to imagine. That's what happens. When the string is, goes to the speed of light squared, you are riding the wave of light. So there's uh, anyway, so seeing him, he's in the patent office with his buddies. There's he's got these two other buddies and they've been talking. They're the ones that are the scientists, you know, and they talk and they've been bouncing it off each other. And then it gets down to this E equals MC squared. And it, and his world takes off, but not right away because people didn't look at him. He didn't have a degree. He didn't have a job. He wasn't a professor. He was a clerk in a patent office. And I feel that way sometimes so much. I've been listening the past couple of weeks to a lot of Greg Braden, some Carolyn Miss, and some other people who have been um, articulating the quantum theories. Um, Nissan Harriman, John, um, Heg Hedlund, Hegland, is that his last name? The University in Ames, Iowa, Myrish University. And every single one, I get to a point and, they, and then they say, but we don't know this and we don't know that. We don't know what happens there. We don't know what happens there. And every single time I like, we do. 
we have a theory and it's so brilliantly Einstein. Even if you don't believe I'm talking to Einstein, it's so brilliant. And that's what drove home last night when I was watching that episode where they got to E equals MC squared. It's like, oh, I felt that way for so long about the system that we've been given. But who's going to listen to a girl who says, well, I wanted to be a rock star, but then I spontaneously started channeling. And then I started channeling angels with these women. And then we started to put all the things they were saying to us to the test on our conflicts between us, of which we've had many. And if you think about angels, you don't think about conflict, but if you think about Albert Einstein, and now Jung, he was another good friend of Albert Einstein's. And I'm gonna post in the um, below or above or wherever you post the link to a talk by, that I just heard yesterday, coincidentally enough, about Carl Jung. And he had the answer to how we're going to survive these totalitarian times. And that was another moment of, oh, we've got the answer. <laughs> But who's going to listen to me? I'm just a girl who talks to dead people and then takes their stuff and goes and actually works it out with my friends. And we've developed conflict revolution training, which is just phenomenal years of, and years of research. And that's going to start in this new configuration too. We're going to start doing more of that. So I, um, in, in dealing with, I was going to look up compassion, but I think I don't want to, because when we're talking about Einstein's definitions of the fifth fundamental force of the universe. What does that really mean in scientific terms? We can look at what it means in terms of the human relationships, because that's the maps of human consciousness, is it explores and gives you pathways in the human relation and the human relationship with yourself. But compassion is the fifth fundamental force, is we're talking about science and to blend the two is a little bit like what compassion is a scientific element. Yeah. And if you think about it, a wasn't the compass Einstein's was just absolutely obsessed with the compass and the definition that we have that we've been given clearly never changes. Compassion is the fifth fundamental force that uses the four fundamental forces to impel the creation of the universe one step at a time. Compassion is the fifth fundamental force. It's the intelligence that uses the four fundamental forces to impel the creation of matter, the universe, one step at a time. So there's a lot of pieces of that definition. I think the one step at a time is important because we can slow down time, we know relativity, uh, and go to from the one step to the two step to the three step, and then it goes on into the infinite steps. And it's going at the speed of light squared, but it's sequential. And compassion as that intelligence, whether it's how you call the universal mind or God or whatever, it's the intelligence. And it uses what's here, the four fundamental forces. Now I dropped out of science. I'm not claiming to know anything about science, but what I've learned, but with Einstein leading me along to be his steno and then to be the lab rat. But electromagnetics, and very basically I put that into, it's the force, that ignites things. So gravity, this is another fundamental force. And this is the force that guides things. Then there's the strong nuclear force. So that's the push pull. And the weak nuclear force is the one that transforms. That's the one that's transforming the caterpillar into the butterfly or changing from red to green or one to two. So these are the forces that science actually recognizes. I'm not making this stuff up. And compassion is that fifth fundamental force that uses these forces 
the intelligence to impel the creation of matter, the universe one step at a time. And, and how does that work, you might say? The mystery behind this whole entire system is what it's rooted in. So before you talk about anything at all having to do with the system that we're exploring with this definition of compassion as the fifth fundamental force, you have to say that at the root of it is a mystery. And part of that is, is because if you look at the map, and again, I'll, I'll put the map up and post it for you, uh, the structure is built upon basically a black hole. And the reason it's a mystery is because in that condition of whatever you call it, antimatter, whatever they want to call it, ether is dark matter, that it's so uh, heated up and it's moving so quickly, it becomes like a void, like a black hole. You can't see in there. You can't, you can see the effects of what's in there, but you can't see into a black hole. And it's the same as true as it has what's called an event horizon, right? The black hole is going down like this, a event horizon that you, you can't, you just, you can't see it. So it's the condition of it. So at the, at the root of the creation of the world is nothing. And it's a mystery. And that piece has a huge um, psychological impact that just in practical peacemaking, it's really hard sometimes to commit to the mystery that you don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow or those kinds of things. But in the scientific world, it, to me what it does is it opens up your mind. Because what you have to say is, I don't really know, but I'm willing to explore. And that way you're not holding on to, this is what it is. Now, I still do that because I've done this for so long, but this is what it is. This is the unified field theory that we're, we're um, exploring. So compassion is the fifth fundamental force. It has that same kind of uh, power of its own, just like electromagnetics has the power to ignite and Strong nuclear force has the power to the repelling and, and, and those things. Three different influences it has while it's creating the universe. One is that like a compass that you draw a circle, compassion impels energy to come from the nothing, even though we can't see it, there's still energy in there. Step out of the nothing and into the physical world in its first step of that sequential journey and create a circle, just like that compass. Compassion does that. And that only this is a sphere. And this is what we call the compilation of consciousness. This sphere, and we all have our own, so steps out of nothing, the mysterious compassion impels it to step out of nothing and into something and it creates the sphere that surrounds the mathematics in the, in the source, as we call it, where everything is, that separates off a piece of it to be me. And in there are all the mathematic, ever-changing mathematics of where I am in the world and how old I am and how my, what are my organs doing and what are, uh, everything, everything, everything. And so at this level of one point, compassion impels energy to step out of nothing and create this one uh, particle that's going to be you and me and you're, you have your particle, I have mine, but do the electro electromagnetic quality of it they can uh, interact. So it's like all these particles bumping at this quantum level with electromagnetics between us. Then compassion uses that same power to create that circular fashion. And it employs the weak nuclear force and from within, it causes this particle to begin to separate. It's still, it's still one particle, 
but suddenly the inside that particle, there's, there's two sub particles. And one of them is your inner world. And one of them is your outer world. And then it again uses the weak nuclear force to transform that into three. And that third becomes the witness of both of them. And that is what creates the very basic ability that allows us to be human. Because in all of that, if this is my particle, is the whole entire world programmed that's going to be riding that wave of light up to the surface of the planet. Because we're in the center of the earth right now. So compassion, then the second force that it exerts upon this particle is this compass that aligns you to true north. That's very simple. Compassion makes sure that every single particle is aligned to true north of the earth. So we're all on the same map. We all go to Chicago at, in, at this time and we meet, we're all gonna be on the same map. But the third part that compassion does within these, this particle is it, and it doesn't even actually do this. It's sort of part of the, it's just the true nature of the birth of it is that all of those particles that are subsetted in there, the three that I mentioned, Compassion infuses the knowledge that you still know it's one particle. You are one together, one mechanism with a lot of different parts. And think about the body. You have the heart, you've got the intestines, you've got the skin, you know, there's a lot of different parts that are all one body. So that knowledge is our birthright. We don't often see it as I am, my body is, the, is rooted in the same place your body is, but it's, that's what compassion does as that fifth fundamental force. Now, knowing that as this in the source, you've got this particle, this com compilation of your consciousness, how does it get to be this? Well, what happens is the Big Bang, much like the one that they claimed happened over all billions of years ago, is really a function of this creative process. So that the Big Bang happens on a smaller scale, perhaps, than the entire universe. However, you're going to see that we're going to create the entire universe on the small scale, is that these three subparticles, and then my particle with your particle, they're bumping each other and they're creating electromagnetics are creating this bang. And that's sending out a light wave from the center of the earth to the surface of the earth. Now on that light wave, is carrying all that subset of everything. And then within the subset of everything, you have these different, the, your internal world, your external world, the one that can witness it. That subset of way of particles are also a wave. And they're gonna flow on this wave up to the surface of the planet, where then when they exit into the external world, What's programmed down here in external, like for example, right now in my external world is programmed Minneapolis, March 26, 2012, it's 9.37 p.m., whatever, you know, all that. When it goes into the external world, your body is created and your body becomes the projector and the perceiver. And the lens of the external world, which is the physical, everything separate. You're not, you're not sitting in my lab, you are separate. So there is separation, very much so. That there's a purpose to have this separation, but not at our root. At our root, we're still all in the source. We still have all come from the same mystery. And stepped out into creation to be a very unique expression of that infinite mystery that's in that 
black hole that's in the center of the planet that is where we begin. So the wave is flowing. It's got all your stuff on it. And as it goes from the molten center of the earth and it's flowing towards the solid, separate experience of the lens, it starts to pull together, starts to get take form, starts to have voice. And then all those things that are programmed to be there, for example, the blue microphone and the purple water thing and my computer, they start to have sound before they get here. So somewhere in the subatomic level of my intellect, it's just getting closer to the planet. We have emotion, intuition, and intellect. That is a chair, that is a chair, that is a chair. Then the body's created, the whole world is projected, and then it's perceived back. But that wave keeps going. It heads back into, out of the lens, up into the heavens until it reaches the electromagnetic field of the earth where it becomes again a part of the earth wave. And it flows up and back and through the North Pole and back down into the center of the planet to begin again. And that string that spins at the speed of light squared is interrupted by the lens when the, it's flowing up and then the, your body's created and everything slows down to the speed of light, separates and you have that human experience. And when your body dies, the lens closes up and everything goes back into the source and you're riding that wave of light again. So I think that when Einstein died, not only did, was he totally obsessed about a unified field theory is how, how do you unify the macrocosm and the microcosm, which really hadn't completely been done, although he did it. I think E equals MC squared is that formula. But he also died terribly, terribly worried about the world and people. And that was his other... Uh, exploration with his friend Sigmund Freud, with his friend Carl Jung, is how do you change humanity from being these people who would launch the greatest war, right? In the 1900s, they had never seen humans do to each other what they did in World War I. And back then, the idea of an uh, airstrike literally was they would fly their little putty putty planes over the battlefield and drop bricks out. And we've gone from that, although we went to World War II, where Einstein had a piece of what happened in Japan, his passion to unlock these questions guided him after he lost his body. And he discovered that, oh gosh, there really was life after death and what an incredibly organized place this is and set about to go to work for his next stage of his uh, contribution to the world from beyond his grave. And I believe after being with this for this long and having my associates be here all along the way that he cr has created the process that will help to revolutionize humanity to become those who understand intrinsically at the root, we are all one. And if we go and bomb all of those people over there, we're only going to be bombing ourselves. And we don't wanna do that anymore. And that's the macrocosm of the dilemma. The microcosm of the dilemma brings us to self-love, which is that this model proves 
that it all starts within you and it comes up, flows up the light, becomes the body and the lens and everything, projecting perfectly whatever's on this wave. So if in the psychological embedding of being human on that wave, you have a lot of self-hate, or you have a lot of internal conflict, that is going to influence the manifestation in that lens. I can't tell and won't even begin to claim to know at what level does my inner conflict that I'm not taking care of influence, say, what's going on in Ukraine right now. I have no idea any kind of exact data or influence. What I do know is on the microcosm that when I allow this un, uh, untreated conflict to come into this human system that's going to ignore that I'm actually one with everyone and if I hurt you, I'm going to hurt myself. I live in this lie that I think, oh my gosh, we have to kill Putin, he's evil. I'm contributing to a condition that helps to spur on on the macrocosm those things. And that's why when I do my work, I think I may not be influencing the UK directly, but I'm helping to solidify a new configuration of humanity that refuses to ignore. And not only that, but that has practically created a process with which to change ourselves from within, to be aligned to that flow of compassion, the fifth fundamental force of the universe, to take care of our inner world, knowing that it will be part of the projection of the outer world. And that compassion as this fifth fundamental force is going to matter, if I get out of the way, if I align to that, if I have self-love and I do this, these steps and work with my three human dimensions in the way that he has taught us in order to get them aligned, I create profound and revolutionary outcomes in conflicts in my own life. Things that I could not have gone directly at. And it's important to remember that in this work that we do, you know, there's this revolution, right? You start in the center of the earth and it, the wave goes up, it explodes into the universe, but it keeps going and it spins. And in, when compassion is impelling us to revolve our conflicts, where, so we don't just look into the lens and try to fix them all in, in here, that we revolve our conflict around to the map of this inner world and take an honest searching inventory as we watch ourselves so we catch ourselves where we're the ones who are perpetrating conflict. And when we do that and we take care of that conflict, there is a natural manifestation in the outer world that changes. It changes the this that's going on and either the person, how many times have I had the person that I've been so angry with and I'm, I'm doing that work, they disappear. They, or or they, they rise to it. That's always my hope is that is, as I do this is I can inspire others to wanna rise to it and do their own revolution and find their own self-love because that's ultimately what we all need right now is to understand our intrinsic nature that we are all one, learn how to do our own microcosm work. And I can tell you that this work, it's very, it's like an art. You know, people want it to be step one, step two, step three, step four, just like, you know, creation, one, two, three, four, boom. And sometimes it's more not. And, and the, the, one of the conflicts I wanted to 
to share briefly was I had this one, we named them all the time, called um, The Drunken Marketing Manager. That was the name of it. And I was an executive assistant and the marketing manager of the company kept giving me it work to do without really asking my boss and but it was part of projects that she was working on, you know, one of those fine lines. And she was a drinker. And then I would do the work because that's what I did. I did what people told me. And, and then she would complain about it. So that process where I have to pull out the intellectual soundbite, you know, get it down to what is she doing? Well, she's asking me to do her work and then she's criticizing me for it. The ultimate place in me where that was conflicting in me had absolutely nothing to do with her or work or anything. It had to do with a conflict I had had with my husband a couple of years ago that was still in the process of healing. And because I was able to revolve that around and, and suspend my judgment, commit to the mystery, no, it doesn't seem like, and I, not that she, not that she wasn't drunk and not that she wasn't doing those things, but when we're dealing with this inner world of ourself, this can be somewhere completely different. So when I realized, you know, and I spent a couple of weeks watching myself, where do I, because I'm always usually so grateful when people do work for me. And if I just sat in my head with that and said, hey, I'm so grateful, but I suspended that, I committed to the mystery. I said, somewhere I am doing this. And I couldn't figure it out. So I called friend, called the lifeline, my coach. And she said, how about this? Remember the time you and your husband, blah, 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 blah. And it was like the aha moment, or sometimes we call it hanging and dang. And I went and took care of that. And a few days later, the marketing manager got fired. Not having nothing to do with anything that I said or did at work, it just happened that way. So when we align to this fifth fundamental force of the universe, compassion, knowing this physics of it, the deep dive into what actually is this force and how does it actually work with things is for me, it's really important for me to understand because it shows you why you can suspend that judgment in that time where you're thinking, yes, but, yes, but, yes, but, she did this, she did this, she did this. I can suspend it and go, wait a minute, mm -mm. this is about this energy, energy flow that's mine, that this is, I'm in charge of this domain. I have total responsibility for intellect, intuition, emotion for every single decision that I make. And let's, let's explore there. Something miraculous always happens. So it goes from the great macrocosm of everything to the microcosm of us. And I am so... Um, honored every day to volunteer and was chosen and that all of my associates who have been here for so long witnessing this and benefiting from it more and more every day. I'm very grateful for all of us. So I'm going to just do a little bit of a channel because I told uh, the party and Einstein that I wanted to talk and he was all for that because just because but um, let's hear from, from them. So I'm gonna turn my video off.